first is, as you're all well aware, we are introducing a zoning change proposal, a zoning text amendment, and a subdivision regulation amendment tomorrow before the full council that was requested by the county executive that would make a streamlined and predictable path for any very, very large employer looking to locate in our urban areas near metros. Um, and uh, we will be considering that. We will have a public hearing on that item, likely on May 15th, um, with council action following the public hearing in the subsequent week or two. So we are uh, we're going to be considering that very carefully and look forward to your questions about it. Second item, introducing another quite different zoning change relating to winemaking and local alcohol production and seeking to bring clarity to the zoning code for people who own property in the agricultural reserve and want to start a business making local beer or wine or cider and, or frankly spirits. And um, today the zoning code is a little murky and the allowed business, kind of related business functions are, are not very clearly spelled out. So the zoning proposal would establish that you can indeed run this kind of a business as a, an accessory to farming. So it has to be so, you know, underlying, continuing a farming use, um, and that you can have events that are normal and customary for the industry. And uh, the goal of it is to open the doors and hopefully begin a new winery industry in Montgomery County. And I've always wondered why we didn't have more wineries in Montgomery County. And you look across the river, you can see there's a lot of wineries in Virginia. In fact, the Virginia wine region is really renowned around the, the seaboard and it's known nationally. And I guess I had always figured it must be because our soil and climate are somehow different and uh, have recently learned that's not the case. And then in fact, we have some of the best soil and um, suitable climate in the region. And it has a lot more to do with uh, policies, procedures, and, and maybe perspective on the welcoming, how welcoming we might be to, the, to an industry here. So I'm hopeful that we'll proceed through this and it, it, it is, you know, it's an initial approach. It is crafted with really um, a lot of different concerns in mind. So I think it's, it's nicely balanced. However, we'll, of course, see how the, the hearings go. And um, my, uh, my, my vision or hope here is that in a few years, we'll have a number of really well-regarded wineries operating in the region, uh, in the county, and the region will begin to, uh, you know, the people who live in the region will come to Montgomery County and have a new quality of life amenity, as well as create a lot of great jobs and help farming, you know, uh, continue into a new era. So those are the two items I wanted to bring forward for you and look forward to uh, questions that you might have. Uh, quick question. Yes. So, um, Peter Francho recently his, um, uh, tap on reform. Reform on tap. Reform on tap. That had hit a bit of a snag, more or less, in Annapolis. Is this kind of a workaround to kind of keep moving for the spirit of her? Is it completely independent? Idea? Oh yes, this is quite quite different from that. Uh, you know, the comptroller has been working on a set of policies that would really kind of revolutionize the legal policy structure for beer mostly, but it maybe extends to other production types, I don't know, in the state. And it would basically say, if you make beer in Maryland, you, don't, you, don't, you can sell as much as you want, you can sell as much as you want as a, as a retail business, you can sell, as, you don't have to go through a distributor. It really kind of upends the historic regulate, regulatory structure of the industry. And um, that beer has been, uh, that proposal has been, um, you know, it's had a rocky road in Annapolis. I think it'll take a little time for, uh, 
folks to begin to get comfortable with such a sweeping change, but the, the craft brewery industry is really working very hard to build relationships with legislators, and I'm hopeful that we'll, not this year, but next year or the year after, really make a change that is intended to unleash the power of craft brewing in Maryland. Uh, are there current regulations <coughs> holding back uh, farmers from establishing wineries in the Andrews area? You can create a winery, um, but it, there are a lot of restrictions, and it can be rather murky. And we have found that winemakers, that the, one, the ones that we have, have had very conflicting views about what rules they think that they are actually operating under today. And we do have a few wineries. You know, we have Rocklands, of course, and Sugarloaf, and um, a remarkable winery in the state called Old, Wens Old Westminster recently purchased a pretty large farm in Clarksburg. And um, we understand that they're planning to grow grapes, but not necessarily to open up a winery here. Um, so what we want to do is clarify the rules and especially clarify the rules around events, because that's, that's been one of the challenges, is if you want to have people come out for you know the, the first Saturday tasting, are you allowed to do that? How many people are you allowed to have? And a lot of those rules were not made with this industry in mind. So we want to clarify those rules, and then we hope that the result will be similar to what it has been with brewery sector, which is once we established not only clear rules of the road that were, you know, that, that supported the, t the business model, but we also put the word out there to the region, like, we really want this industry. We are excited about it. And that really has seemed to pay off. So we, we hope that uh, by proceeding with this change, I hope that by proceeding with this change, presuming my colleagues will agree, that we would get to the same kind of great outcome with a new winery industry. Are there restrictions on how many people could attend these wineries mm -hmm. in the bill? Because, I mean, the Ag Reserve, they, they yep. feel like they have this bucolic life up there, you know, very rural. And these wineries can attract hundreds of people on a weekend, maybe even thousands for big events. Can the infrastructure up there handle that? It can, in, in, uh, according to limits. So what we have proposed is that Events, um, generally speaking, you know, if you want to have a wedding at your winery, if you want to have a corporate retreat at your winery, as long as there's not more than 300 people, you know, that that's generally okay. But if you want to go bigger than that, then you're going to have to go through some additional processes. Um, the current code is uh, not, not very clear on that, I'll just say that. And so... There are a lot of those kinds of events that are usual and customary for the industry. You know, it's part of the business model of a winery. And we want to allow that without going so far that, in fact, you know, we undermine the success of other businesses that are operating in the Ag Reserve. And that's, that's an important balance. If you're, you know, if you have a horse farm and you're next to a business that wants to open a winery, you know, you have, you have some, some questions about how those two if, is there friction between the two? So we're trying to, with this proposal, find the right balance, and um, you know I'm, I'm hopeful we'll get to the right place. And then, as I said, a few years from now, there will be a number of terrific wineries opening. And of course, we're doing other things around this. We've got, you know, we're working very hard on a on a facility to provide equipment, mm -hmm. so that people who want to start wineries can essentially, you know, use equipment that the county would own through the Revenue Authority to kind of get started. So we're trying to do a lot of stuff to foster this, but I, I think, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a feature, it's an amenity that a lot of people in the county would really enjoy and appreciate having. And I'm sure a lot of our residents do cross the river and, and you know, take advantage of the opportunities that exist in other parts of the region, and they would be delighted to stay closer to home and spend their dollars supporting local businesses here. On the, the first zoning adjustment you mentioned, uh, are you at all worried something may be lost uh, by having essentially the time that these big 
companies and, and proposals are in front of the council going from 120 to 60 days, would something be lost in that process? We would not want to lose any public um, goal through that change. Uh, we, you know, we have a lot that we want to get out of development. There's no question about it. And uh, it, it is definitely my belief that if we staff it properly, we can do everything faster. Um, you know, it would require a different staffing approach. You know, you can't just use the existing approach and pretend that you're going to cut it in half. You know, we, we would have to come up with a kind of a special fast lane staffing model that, you know, would be uh, to, to make that possible. And if we were to do that, I think we could, you know, we, we, it would, we, all participation would need to be on an accelerated timeline, there's no question, but um, I think it would work. The county executive said the current zoning process isn't, in, isn't as quick as the jurisdictions that the county is competing against. It, would there be a way to make it so that all the projects go through this expedited speeding process? this expedited review process? Yeah, you know, um, first of all, I, I, I didn't, I'm not 100% in agreement about that. Um, <laughs> you know, we've made a lot of improvements to our development process over the last few years. And our zoning code now has a pretty uh, strong requirement for 120 days. And we have really put a lot of focus on that whole regulatory process and we've sped it up and we you know we there are some proposals that I'm working on the others are working on that would sped it up speed it up further having said that I think that um, there's no question that we would need to do something even different you know if an employer of this size wanted to come in and needed to be confident that they could put up you know 10 15 20 buildings over a period of 5, 10, 15 years, you know, it's, it's an, just in a, there's a confidence level. So we're trying to be very explicit about what we would want to be able to offer. Um, and I can't imagine that any other jurisdiction could, you know, that, 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 it, uh, that is in the run would be able to beat that. You know, that's, that's really very strong. So. You know, I think that uh, we have made a lot of improvements to our development process, and we always need to keep that focus, keep focused on that, and continue to make improvements to it. Uh, but this is kind of another order of magnitude. You know, this is this is setting up a process that is intended to just clarify that if they want to come, we can make it happen. Bottom line. A lot of people might see this as kind of illogical that you're giving fast track to some of the most transformative biggest projects that could have the widest impact. How can you sort of explain that that logic and and what is essentially the need for this? Well, um, the need for it is again, it's a it's a confidence level that if you are a company that needs to essentially build an entire downtown, you know, in a not in a rush, but in a predictable timeline. You know, if you want to add another 1,000 employees next year, and you need to, like you don't want to have the construction process be what's preventing your company being able to bring those 1,000 employees in. And so we just, we need to be able to keep pace with the level of growth of a company that wants to do this. And, you know, we, I do think we will have a challenge to figure out at the front end, like, how does this all work? What is the public, you know, what are the public concerns? And how do we try to address them maybe up front so that the subsequent buildings are um, on a smoother path? You know, it's going to be a, a big effort. There's no question about it. But I would say that, you know, a lot of the work has been, you know, we have, we have revised the master plans for a lot of our downtowns. And we have already spelled out how you could fit development of this scale into those areas. You know, that's really, I think, one of the interesting dimensions of this story is that we have put forward visions for the next 20, 30 years in the county that 
allow for something of this magnitude to occur. And so, you know, which isn't to say we've worked everything out. You know, we, of course, we'd have a tremendous job to proceed. But generally speaking, we know where development of this scale could go. We know what implications it might have in a very general way. And we know what we have to do to make it happen. And that's, that's really a testament to a good planning process and to a focus on the long term and to a vision of the future. And I think, you know, the council and the county deserve recognition for that. On a separate topic, in Annapolis, obviously, it's 90 Dye, and uh, one of the more high-profile bills has been uh, requiring localities to put forth a plan to provide school resource officers or law enforcement presence at all of their schools. Uh, they are obviously planning on some funding for this, but it's assumed that a lot of that uh, funding is going to fall to the localities. What are your thoughts on that bill? Well, we have, in our county, funded more student resource officer positions, and we definitely feel that that has been extremely valuable. You know, we've, there's been a number of incidents where the SRO has, you know, really saved the day. So we understand and, and support the need for SROs. Um, I will have to see that legislation in its final form. Uh, I don't, you know, we, we, there's no question we could not afford to put an SRO in every school in Montgomery County. It's just couldn't do that. Um, so we'll look to see what kind of flexibility they are seeking to provide and um, you know, what the budget implications would be for us. But I don't think that necessarily most people would want a police officer in a K-2 school. Um, but uh, you know, at the same time, I think we generally really strongly believe in the program and we're going to continue to expand it as best we can. Do you know where the, the, those officers are at now? I believe every high school and some middle schools. Is that accurate? I believe that is accurate. I think they tend to share. There's a few where the schools where they may share, um, but yeah, they they are, they are they have a, a plan to respond, you know, to a, a call and for every high school and middle and um, you know they're spending they spend time as they as they deem it is strategic for the public safety program, um, but it is a great program and and it you know really does have an impact. What would you envision for maybe some K-2 schools uh, in terms of falling under this bill, if there is a requirement, would they continue sharing law enforcement? What would you envision for that requirement? Yeah, I mean, as I saw, I saw a new story um, about this legislation, and it, it appeared to me that there was quite a lot of flexibility, you know, for the school district. Uh, that's, that's what I recall seeing. So it was more like you've got to have a plan to respond to concerns, something like that. So I, I don't know if anybody has a copy of it, but it, it um, I think that they know that they can't just hand down a, a mandate, because officers, you know, they come with, the payroll cost, the full cost of, a, of an officer is not inconsequential. So, um, you know, again, I think I'm gonna have to see the legislation in its final form to really have a better sense of how it would affect the county, but um, I would be very surprised if they weren't planning to provide sufficient flexibility. And if they don't, we're, we're going to have a real challenge on our hands, that's for sure. Can you talk about the budget? Um, how much of the shortfall is affecting the budget for the next fiscal year? And, you know, there was unclear projections last time. Can you, do you have a better picture of what the tax revenue are going to be for the next fiscal year? Well, um, you know, we have the projections given to us by the executive branch for the budget, and uh, we, we expect that there will be movement in the numbers at the end of the year as more and more of the tax policy consequence from the federal level become clear. Um, I think we, we, we haven't yet taken up our, our council's review of the projections themselves that comes in the budget process. But um, generally speaking, it's a pretty conservative uh, budget. And I think the executive made a lot of tough choices in that budget. And um, it doesn't seem like it's overly optimistic, you know, to, to me in my, in my overview of it. But we'll see how council staff views it and what they recommend. But, um, you know, we, we, we definitely 
did the right thing with the council savings plan that we enacted a few months ago that cut the gap by more than $50 million. And, um, you know, I think that this budget will be tight. There's no question about it. There's not going to be a lot of room for new initiatives this year. Uh, at the same time, the community's priorities are going to continue moving forward. And yeah. There's five public hearings this week on the budget. Have you heard from residents about potential concerns that could come up at those public hearings? Are there points of contention in this, this new budget that Ike, has, Ike Leggett has proposed? Um, I, I, don't, I guess I don't have an advanced view of the testimony yet, um, but uh, you know, there will be, yeah, sorry. I don't, I don't have an advanced view of the, of okay. the testimony so no, yet. No overarching <laughs> controversy at this point? I don't. I, I haven't seen it. I don't. I don't expect any red hot controversies. Okay. I saw that there are some cuts proposed to to the fire and rescue service. These are similar cuts that the county executive proposed during the savings plan to a few trucks and apparatus. I think it's like three and a half million. Do you think the council will go through with those? Um, well, were those cuts or were those um, were those not additions? Um, I'm not it's sure if there's a council staff. staff. To take um, multiple apparatus off. Yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see what the council's view of that is. We've we've been investing hand over fist in, in public safety and, and really doing our best to meet the need of the community. And fire and rescue has really been, you know, at the top of the list, you know, year after year. So, you know, we'll we'll see how this uh, budget proceeds. That is that is one item, though, that certainly flagged in my mind. Yes. <laughs> Uh, just to put a bow tie, sorry, going back to the um, to the regulations for the, the wine that you spoke about sure. earlier. What's the timeline on that? You said there's going to be another introduction tomorrow, and then what's what happens after the next step after that? Um, well, the, the legislation will be introduced, or the, the zoning change will be introduced tomorrow, and then there will be a public hearing within about a month, and uh, May 15th at 1.30 p.m., afternoon public hearing. and. I don't think a committee meeting has been scheduled yet. Um, typically, they would come within a few weeks after the public hearing. That's also a kind of peak budget, so it could very well be that you know we don't have time at the full council to act on this until into the summer. We'll see. Um, but uh, certainly, personally, I hope we can definitely wrap it up before the fall. And you're looking forward to hearing what the people have to say on this possible new industry. Yeah. Well, there's so many different interests at stake. You know, you've got the consumer, you know, the, 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 the county resident who might enjoy the opportunity to purchase local wine, to visit wineries. You've got farmers, you know, who might be impacted by different business models, whether that's impacted because they want to start a business like this or because they have a business nearby. You've got residents who live there who have concerns about roads. You have residents there who are excited about, you know, the opportunity to be near a winery, so it's we're going to hear from all different all different types. And, and just to piggyback on that, uh, obviously the county has something of a reputation around liquor control. Are you worried that that perception might bleed over into this new industry at all? Well, you know, it's interesting when you look at what we've been able to accomplish with local breweries. You know, what what you see there is that uh, they are in their own lane. You know, the the local alcohol production industry is in its own lane. And our breweries are, are just, uh, you know, they're really popping. It, they're, we're adding new breweries all the time. There'll be two new breweries coming into Silver Spring uh, shortly. We got another one looking in the Ag Reserve. It's, you know, that it, it really is taking off. And it seems at the moment that it's irrespective of the county's unique approach to a warehouse and to the retail sale of spirits. Um, I, I could see the same being the case for wineries. We'll, we'll see how that conversation goes. It was a very significant issue when we tackled liquor reform a few years ago. We heard from some winemakers that they were very reluctant to sell wine through the county warehouse because they didn't trust that the county would handle the wine properly and they couldn't take the risk of delivering you know, bad wine uh, or having bad wine delivered to the customer. 
And we heard that from some breweries as well. So um, we will have to ensure that our winemakers feel confident in having their product delivered. And uh, that will definitely be an important item for us to uh, follow along with. And, um, you know, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how they want to handle distribution in general. And do they want to self-distribute? Do they want to distribute through the county? So a lot of questions ahead of us. But in general, I think the brewery scene is, that's here is proof that, you know, we can, we can have a thriving local production industry. And um, I hope we can do the same thing with the winery industry. Uh, on an unrelated topic, uh, Councilmember Roger Berliner had raised at a county executive debate that the council might take a look at um, the county executive's proposal to place a daycare facility at the former Silver Spring Library on Coatesville mm -hmm. Road. Do you know when that might come before the council and would the council consider not approving that and is it interested in placing affordable housing there? Um, that has been a hot topic um, for couple months now we've received a lot of communications about it a lot of emails from residents and we what the council's role at the moment is do we believe that the former library that that property that site is no longer needed so we will be taking up that question at committee I'm, I don't know it's coming up pretty soon it might be scheduled or it'll no it's not scheduled yet um, I see Jacob is in the back. Is it scheduled yet, Jacob? Or it's, it's not. It's not it's scheduled yet. Transmittal, I think, would probably come towards the end of April at the earliest. The county executive's transmittal. Right. right now, we're just in the council comment period. Thank you. So, it has a ways to go yet, but uh, no question, it is a it's a big issue, and we will take it up when the executive brings it before us. Where are you on it? Well, I have, I have concerns about it, uh, no doubt. Um, and so I, I guess I, don't, I haven't quite made up my mind, but I would like to see that public benefits are maximized in, in any time we dispose of, of property. And I'm a little concerned that the proposal doesn't maximize public benefits. So I want to see, you know, I want, to, I, want to, I want to really review that closely because if we're going to let go of land, you know, we have to be very confident in the terms of the deal and the public interest uh, at stake. So there's definitely a lot to talk about. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you.